Hey guys, welcome. I have made a couple of videos in the past on object pooling, but over the years I've made a lot of tweaks and optimizations to my system and I want to share the end results with you. I use this in every single game that I work on. So by the end of this video, we're going to have an extremely easy to use object pooling system that will feel very similar to instantiate and destroy. We're going to have a clean hierarchy because everything goes into its own respective category. And we're going to be using generics so that we can return any type from these just like the instantiate method. Ready? Let's go. So here's my scene right now. I just have a simple script that I'm using to spawn in these orbs whenever we hold down our mouse button. And they have a script on them which destroys them after two and a half seconds. So we're going to go and build our object pooling system and then we're going to come back here and replace these calls so that you can see how easy it is to use. So we're going to create a script called object pool manager. And I'll attach that to a new game object that I'm going to call pooler because it needs to live in our scene somewhere. So right here is fine. And let's open it up. So here are the namespaces that we're going to need. And just take note that we'll be making use of Unity's pool namespace because there's some really useful code there that we can tap into, which is going to make this a lot easier. And we only need a few variables to get started. We'll add the option to add these objects to don't destroy on load. And this can come in especially handy with things like sounds if you spawn them in and you want them to continue playing even during a scene load or something like that. And as I said, we'll be keeping a nice clean hierarchy, so we're going to add an empty holder for those. As well as empty game objects for each of our different categories. Feel free to add as many as you want. I'm really just putting these here for example's sake. And then we'll need two dictionaries. One which is going to take a game object as the key, and the value is going to be an object pool. And the other will also take a game object as the key and the value will also be a game object. We're also going to set up a simple enum with all of our different pool types. If you add more categories here, make sure you include them in the enum because this is going to tell the pooler where we want to spawn the objects in. Then in awake, we're going to initialize those new dictionary. And the reason I'm doing this in awake instead of up here in the class is so that this stays compatible with my do not reload domain or scene option for the play mode here. Static variables don't reset themselves with this option selected. So just in case you like this option, we're going to do it in awake. And now we'll call a setup empties method. All this is going to do is set up new game objects in the scene. So we'll create the main holder. And then we're going to make all the rest child objects of that empty holder. And if we checked add to don't destroy on load, then we'll do that here by grabbing the root transform of any of the child empties. It doesn't matter which one. I usually don't select this option, but it does depend on how your game is structured. So it's nice to have the option. Now before we can actually create our method that's going to handle spawning objects into the game, we need to first create some stuff to handle all of the pooling behind the scenes. So we're going to create a method called create pool with a game object, vector3, quaternion, and pool type as the parameters. But we're going to give the pool type a default of game object so that we don't have to use that parameter. It keeps it completely optional. But if you want things to go into different categories, then we would just do that with this enum. And to keep things easier to read, I'll create a few separate methods. We'll need a create object method, which returns a game object, and it's going to have all the same parameters as the above. We'll also need an on get object, passing in a game object. An on released object, also passing in a game object. And finally, an on destroy object, same parameter for that as well. So let's go back up here and deal with the pool and then we'll go back and fill in all those other methods. So we need to create a new object pool taking in the game object type and we'll create a new one here. So for our create func, we'll call our create object method and pass in all of the parameters. When we get the object from the pool, we'll call on get object. When we release an object from the pool, we'll call on release object. And when we destroy an object in the pool, we'll call on destroy object. And then finally, we'll add this entry to our dictionary. By the way, if you prefer Lambda to all of these separate functions, I will show you how to do that in just a sec. 
So when we create an object, first and foremost, I want to set the actual prefab to inactive. This is literally going to make our one singular prefab asset in our project inactive, but this is, as far as I know, the only way to ensure that we spawn in an object and not have awake or on enable called guaranteed. That's going to help us avoid all kinds of headaches. So the actual prefab itself is inactive. Now let's actually instantiate in an object because this is called when there's nothing in the pool yet to actually release. And now that that's done and our new copy of the prefab has been spawned in and it's inactive, we can now reactivate our prefab. And since we're keeping things neat and tidy, we'll set the parent of our object with this method that we're going to create in just a minute. And then return the object. For on get object, you can actually just leave that blank, but it is nice to have it here in case you want to add in some optional logic there for when we get the object. For on release, this is putting our object back into the pool. So here is where we'll deactivate it. And when we destroy the object, we want to remove the object from our clone to prefab dictionary if it exists. And if you'd rather do all of this logic inside the create pool method, you can do it using Lambda like this, but you may or may not find this less readable. So I'll just comment that out and we'll use what we already made. Okay, so this is actually most of our logic already done right here. But I did say we needed to set up a method called set parent object. And for that, we'll pass in a pool type. And this is just going to do a simple switch statement to determine which game object to use as the parent. Okay, so that's everything we need to be able to actually create the method that we're going to call when we want to spawn our objects into the game. So we'll call that method spawn object, but it's going to return a generic type T and we need to pass in T here as well. Now, if you're not familiar with writing generics, you will recognize seeing them from things like get component calls where you would pass in the component type that you're looking for when getting that component. And we'll do the same four parameters that we've been doing. Game object, vector three, quaternion, and pool type, which again will give a default of type game objects. And at the end here, we need to add where t colon object here. What this is, is a generic type constraint. So it's going to constrain t to be an object. Object is the base class for all objects that Unity can reference, like game objects and components. T could have been anything before, even something that wouldn't make sense, like a float. So this constrains it and makes it type safe. Okay, so inside the actual method, we're going to check if the pool already exists. And if it doesn't, then we'll create one right now. So if our object pool does not contain our key, then we call create pool. Next, let's get our game object by grabbing our object to spawn from our dictionary and calling Unity's get method from their pool system. This is what will actually attempt to retrieve an object from the pool and reactivate it. Or if there's not one in the pool, then it's going to instantiate one for us to use. And assuming it finds or creates one, then we need to add this game object to our clone to prefab map dictionary. We need this dictionary because each time a new game object is instantiated, it creates a new instance of our prefab. So we need to ensure we grab that one so we know which one to return to the pool when we call our return method. And now we'll set our position and rotation to equal whatever we passed in in the parameters. And finally, in case it pulled one from our pool, it's going to be inactive, so we need to activate it. Now, there are two cases that I want to be able to handle here. One is if our T is actually a game object. And if it is, we'll return object as type T. Otherwise, if it's not a game object, it's going to be a component, whether it be a rigid body or an audio source or a script, whatever, doesn't matter. So we'll get component of type T. Now, if that happens to be null, then let's log an error here to help debug our problem in the future. And then return null. Otherwise, we'll return the component. And if somehow our object was null, then we'll return null. Now again, because we want this to be able to handle both components and game objects, we are going to create two overload methods. One will actually take in a generic type T so we don't have to pass in a game object, we could pass in any component. And for that to be possible, we'll say where T colon component here. And then we need one to handle just game objects as well. 
So this one returns a game object and it takes in a game object as well. Now for both of these, we're just going to call the one that we already created. So it's nice and easy. Okay, now finally, we just need to create a return object to pool method. We'll make the game object required since that's the key to our dictionary, as well as an optional pool type, which will default to game objects. So let's try to get the value from our clone to prefab map dictionary, and we'll get our parent object. And if our object is not currently parented to that object, then we'll reparent it so it goes back to where it should go. And then also let's try to find the value from our object pools dictionary. And if it finds it, then we will release the object. If it can't find anything in the clone to prefab map dictionary, then we're trying to return an object that isn't pooled and we'll need to look into that. Okay, so let's try it out. Back in my spawner script, I'm just going to replace my instantiate call with our object pool manager dot spawn object, passing in the object, the position and the rotation, just like with instantiate. And where the object destroys itself, I'll instead return it to the pool. Now you can see when we play, we get this object pools object here, and inside it, we have our three other categories. And if I click around, you can see they all get added to game objects and then they deactivate themselves. Perfect. And that was when we passed it in as a game object. But just like with instantiate, we said that we could change this to whatever type we want. So let's say rigid body 2D, because my prefab does have one of those on it. And this time, let's actually get a reference to the rigid body and change its gravity after we spawn it in. And just to show how this works as well, let's instead put this in particle systems instead of the default, even though it's not. And once that's done, we'll want to put this back into particle system as well so that it goes to the right place because that's where we're spawning it from. And you can see it's spawning in, it's applying gravity and returning to the particle system category. Now, one other scenario that I want this to be able to handle is what if we want to automatically parent what we spawn into something? We have that option for instantiate, so let's do that here as well. So we can actually copy our spawn object method but we'll change the vector three to a transform and call it parent. So all of this here can be the same, but instead of setting the position and rotation in the world, we'll set the parent to the parent and change our local position to vector 3.0 and pass in the spawn rotation for our local rotation. And all this at the bottom can stay the same as well. Now our create pool method is going to give us an error because we don't have a create pool method that takes in a transform, so we'll need to make one. It can just be copied from the other one. It just needs to take in a transform instead of a vector three. And then we'll also need a new create object method as well with those same new parameters. So for this, the instantiate will only take in the prefab and the parent. We'll set our local position to zero and our rotation to the rotation we pass in and our local scale to vector 3.1. Everything else stays the same, except we can get rid of this here since our instantiate call handles the parenting for us. We don't want this going into one of our empty game objects this time because we want it to be parented to whatever we pass in as the transform. And I did forget to change this to parent right here. And finally, we want our two overload methods for spawn objects, which these are the ones that we'll actually be calling from other scripts. These are the same as the other ones that we already made, just with different parameters. So let's test this out as well. Instead of passing in the world position here, we'll pass in a transform that I'll pass into the inspector. And just to be safe and make sure that our generic overload methods are working as well, let's also change the rigid body's gravity scale to one, so I'll leave this here. You can see I added this moving thing here. That's the parent. And if I spawn in the orbs, you can see that they are parenting themselves to that moving thing. And obviously based on their behavior, you can tell as well. And after they go back to where they belong. So there you go, guys. Hopefully you will find this as useful as I have in all of my project. I hope you enjoyed and thanks so much for watching. See you next week.